Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Elephant TV's latest edition of its conversations that have come out of the coronavirus pandemic. And um, this uh, evening, it's my pleasure to, to welcome Miss Ayantu Ayana, um, who is uh, coming to us all the way from Los Angeles, uh, where she is uh, a PhD student uh, at the University of California at Los Angeles. Uh, in the Department of Information Studies, and uh, she's also a community organizer and uh, archivist, archivist and uh, somebody who's passionate about Ethiopian history and especially uh, Oromo history and culture. Um, good evening, uh, uh, th this evening. Good evening. Thank you, John. Um, I want to let me just start by asking you know, we read lots of stories about uh, COVID-19 in, in, uh, in the U.S. And, uh, and what's going on there. How are you keeping? How is your family? Are you keeping safe, keeping well? Um, yes. Uh, you know, COVID and well, right now I'm actually in Minneapolis. I ran away here for a bit. Um, but, you know, the numbers in, in, in Los Angeles were really rising. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been a lot of sitting at home. It's very similar to what I imagine you've been doing in Nairobi. Are you in Nairobi? Sorry. Yes, I, yep. I, I am no, in Nairobi. Yeah. 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 Uh, great. And you're all keeping well and safe and uh, yeah. good. Um, let me get right into it, uh, um, Ayantu. I, I um, you know, the whole region and the the whole world is very excited about developments in Ethiopia. Uh, you have a new, young, very dynamic prime minister um, who has rebooted relations, relations with uh, Eritrea. And he's won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, already and made quite, quite a number of changes, released political prisoners, etc. Uh, and I was just wondering whether you can give us uh, just a bit of a background, the political, economic, and social. What circumstances brought about this change? What, what circumstances brought this young um, leader, Abiy Ahmed, uh, to the leadership of, of, of Ethiopia uh, at the time that it did? Um, so between 2014 and 2018, uh, which is when Abiy Ahmed came to power, there was this youth-led grassroots movement um, called the Oromo Protests. Um, and, um, you know, it had at, at its core issues of land, freedom, self-government. Um, and what actually initially triggered the protest was this planned expansion of the administrative structures of the capital into, um, into Oromo land, essentially, into the land of Oromo farmers, uh, who have a history of being displaced in the name of development. Um, and also, um, there was, you know, politically, the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front had been in power for um, over two decades um, and under the control of the Tigrayan People's uh, Liberation Front, the TPLF from here on, had really dominated um, politics. There was very little space to do anything politically outside of their very narrow political framework. Uh, freedom of assembly um, and speech were severely restricted especially so in Oromia, um, but also there was, you know, the economic issue um, along with the deep authoritarianism, rampant violations of rights, and all of these things kind of gave birth to the Oromo protests and later the Amhara protests. And so there was all this upheaval to do with the contradictions within the state, both historically and also with the APRDF's governance um, structure. Yeah. Um, and and um, this led to um, the resignation of the prior prime minister um, mm -hmm. um, and 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 Mr. Uh, Abiy Ahmed uh, stepping mm -hmm. in. But uh, he he comes uh, he comes from he comes from Romia as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one thing that has has, has I think many outsiders are still trying to understand is um, um, there's still quite a, a sense of, uh, of of the Oromo region being quite restive, um, mm -hmm. despite despite the fact that um, um, 
uh, leader from the Oromo community is now Prime Minister of Ethiopia, has made quite a, a number of changes. What explains the fact that um, uh, despite his uh, um, Abiy Ahmed coming to office, uh, making a, many changes in a, you know, in a short space of time, um, it doesn't seem to have sorted out some of the contradictions that led to the resignation of the previous prime minister and him coming to, to, to office. Or are we judging yeah. him? Well, you know, the, the Oromia remains restive and the Oromo protests are now back on because the structural um, and historical issues have not been resolved um, in terms of um, self-governance, in terms of the reform agenda, which Abiy Ahmed had promised to oversee, um, including um, getting the country ready for uh, maybe its first free and fair election in a very, in ever or in a very long time. Um, and none of those things have been realized. Um, initially, yes, Abe did release political prisoners, but the prisons are now full with prisoner, with political prisoners again, including some of Abe Ahmed's uh, most prominent, um, I guess, you know, opposition figures who are his opponents. Um, and there's, in fact, what we see in Oromia is a uh, re-entrenchment of imperial politics that are, you know, very, to, to which people are very sensitive because of its very um, ugly history in that country. Um, and so people are getting um, what they did not ask for. They asked for decolonization and democratization. Instead, they're getting re-entrenchment of imperial power. So you could see, yeah. I, I, um, I'd be grateful for um, just, you know, again, I'm looking, presume that I have no information. I'm totally, you're educating me, sort of uh, uh, Ethiopian politics 101. Um, one of the fascinating things about the, the Ethiopian model of governance uh, mm. that, the, you know, the, the, that, you know, the, the ruling party implemented in the 1990s was this. Um, um, ethnic federalism. So you have uh, Oromia region, um, you, you have Ogaden region, which is largely Somali, um, you have the Amaras, etc., etc. Um, of course, this has been viewed cautiously across Africa. Many of us have had issues with, with uh, tribalism and clanism and, and, and the kind of fragmentation that follows that. And um, one of the initiatives that uh, Prime Minister Abi Ahmed has seems to have engaged in is, is, you know, he's created a new prosperity party and seems to be trying, trying to fold Ethiopia back into a unitary kind of system. Now that has got its has has got its sympathizers across Africa who who have suffered the you know including genocide and other other um, troubles that are caused by by ethnicity and clanism and all that that kind of thing. Maybe educate educate our viewers a little bit on on, on this particular system in you know, of ethnic federalism in uh, in Ethiopia. What are its roots, and what what are the roots of the current uh, uh, you know continuing turmoil in in in, uh, in Ethiopia, despite this system, and and what seems to be the prime minister's attempt uh, to go backwards into into a more centralized system. Well, I think. I think, John, it's very important to begin with a correction to a very dominant misconception that the introduction of ethnicity into Ethiopian governance is a post-1991 reality. And that uh, the assumption that prior to that, somehow Ethiopia was ethnically neutral, uh, which it was not. Um, ethnicity was introduced to the Ethiopian governance and political system when a culturally Abyssinian king, Menelik II, conquered and imposed over the newly colonized territory the cultural, political, and economic arrangements of Amhara elites. So what we have had for the last 120 years is essentially uh, a state predicated on Amhara Tigray cultural foundation, myths, uh, language, identity, and history. Um, and the Amharization of the Ethiopian state, and by extension, um, you know, over, over the conquered peoples and territories has been one of the core principles that has been resisted since um, 
going you know, going all the way back to the foundation of the empire, but specifically, you know, since the 1960s when uh, groups were establishing themselves based on these national territories. Um, so, like you know, Amhara ethnicity is ethnicity, uh, like in, in in the sense that it's like Oromo ethnicity. It's not any different. And the fact that this ethnicity has been imposed on Ethiopia's peoples um, plays a very important role in terms of what do, what does it mean to be Ethiopian today? What does that look like? And these are questions that are constantly being you know renegotiated. And so, strictly speaking, the Ethiopian state that we had under Menelik and Haile Selassie and the Derg was, was an Amhara state, culturally speaking, but also in terms of political interests and whatnot, in terms of the elite, that is. Um, and I think, you know, the other important point to make is that the Ethiopian constitution of 1991 speaks of nations, nationalities, and people. Um, it is mostly those elites who are against multinational federalism that use the term ethnic federalism um, okay. because they are opposed to it. And they know that the term ethnic federalism has a way of generating, you know, all kinds of irrational fears among African elites, you know. Um, and, you know, I really just, you know, like the constitution, to, the preamble to the Ethiopian constitution is we the nations, nationalities and peoples of Ethiopia. Um, and it's very much, you know, focused on the plurality of those peoples and those nations. Um, and so it's also important in that sense to place the establishment of the 1995 federal system within its historical context. The Derg tried the centralization thing yeah. under Ethiopia or death. It literally was killing everybody who disagreed with it. Um, the result was that the state was surrounded by all these national you know, uh, liberation fronts, the Oromo and Tigray and Somalis and Sidamas, Afar, Hadiyas, and many others. And the only, you know, the only way to keep Ethiopia intact at the end of that, you know, when the Derg was over, was to move towards decolonization and decentralization. Um, it did not work as planned, but it still represented progress and it still does to most of Ethiopia's people, especially those that have been historically marginalized. Um, and so I feel like people forget that you know, in 1991, there was really, you know, there wasn't, there was no option for keeping the centralized state. It was either you separate and everybody creates, you know, new political formations, or you create multinational federalism, which recognizes the nations that were conquered by Menelik, along with their identity, culture, and language, which had been, you know, subjected to varying levels to cultural genocide under the One Ethiopia project. And it promised regional autonomy and shared federal rule. Um, and these were the two primary conditions. These were the minimums to which historically dominated peoples, you know, agreed to stay within Ethiopia. And of course, we know Eritrea chose to completely, you know, exit from that project. Uh, and so, I, I guess like far from simply introducing um, ethnic federalism to or ethnicity into Ethiopian politics, what, what the 1991 arrangement did was finally having, the, you know, the state recognize its own longstanding historical realities, which it had been denying. Um, and I feel like this point is often lost when the debate becomes about how ethnicity is the problem or, you know, all these other issues. Yeah. Um, the, the, you know, again, the, the, the region was rather, you know, startled by the strength of, the strength and the, you know, just the power of the emotion um, that, and the outpouring that accompanied um, the murder of uh, Hachalu Hundesa, um, mm -hmm. who, who uh, was clearly, uh, uh, you know, a, a musician who spoke to the hearts of, of uh, uh, and, and, and expressed um, the, uh, the aspirations of, of, of Oromo people. Uh, yeah. Can you tell me what, what that was, I mean, what that was all about? I mean, because, you know, as you can imagine in, in the rest of the region, we'd never heard of him. And all of a sudden, um, this, this young man uh, dies and, and you have this massive explosion. Mm -hmm. uh, where, what, what space was that coming from? And, and what does it say about the current that um, this Oromo, a musician and activist um, is assassinated 
and the Oromo community, of which the Prime Minister is a member, uh, expresses okay. itself in such a strong way. Um, what, what, what does it say about the current situation? And, and, um, and, where, it's, and where does it come from? Sorry. Yeah. Um, well, this is a very good question. I think we need to um, go back a little bit over the last year and a half um, of, um, or even over the last, you know, a good chunk of the last two years where Abe, Abe came to power. There was a lot of excitement uh, throughout Ethiopia and throughout Oromia. People were like, um, you know, here's a possibility for a real change, especially because the Oromo protests had created a change in, I guess, at the political level, at least, in peaceful exchange of power, which, which is not something Ethiopians do, if you know about our history. It's either you come in <laughs> deposing an emperor. <laughs> uh, and so there was a lot of excitement. However, um, you know, it, things have, people have been paying a lot of attention to what's happening with Abe externally, how he's being received. But in Oromia itself, uh, people have been skept have been growing skeptical because, so for instance, Western Oromia was put and has been under um, military command post. It's an area that is not, you know, where Abe is not very popular. Um, his soldiers have committed extrajudicial killings, torture, burning the houses of farmers. So this is all happening uh, at the same time. Uh, Abe's rhetoric uh, of unification actually was received as um, it gave it generated a lot of colonial narratives that had been kind of dying out or at the very least that had been marginalized um, it, it gave a lot of um, power to them suddenly you were hearing very anti-oromo things um, you were hearing a lot of narratives about the emperor um, how great he was um, Abe himself renovated the palace and he memorialized the emperors and so all of this was being looked at from the perspective of the people in the Oromia region like uh, uh, this is not what we signed up for um, and so when Haj Alu died it was just kind of like the tipping point so this explosion of anger and uh, frustration, it's been building, largely um, not, not spoken of outside of Oromo, you know, sort of Oromo media, Oromo political landscape, but it's been growing. And so the, the killing itself was very traumatic because one, it comes as part of a very long history of um, prominent Oromo artists, activists, opposition groups being assassinated, being targeted, uh, was of this generation. He was part of this um, Oromo protest movement. Music spoke to the, to the issues that, um, that face ordinary Oromo people, a majority of whom live in rural areas, um, and this young generation. So his, his killing just felt like hope people had was taken away. Um, and then the ensuing crackdown has been, um, you know, within hours after Haj Alu was assassinated, we saw um, media shutdowns, we saw the arrest of major opposition groups, and then we saw indiscriminate attack, uh, indiscriminate uh, arrests of, um, of activists across the region. Um, now that it, we're six, now that we're eight weeks out of that, it felt like a very premeditated crackdown that's widespread. Um, there, was, there was violence against minority and ethnic communities where the government failed to protect them. Um, not only did it fail to protect them, but after the fact, the government has gone on a demonizing campaign, demonizing protesters and blaming them for this violence rather than investigating in a transparent way and letting people know who are the perpetrators, who, fund, who, who organized this, who orchestrated this. So people are feeling like the government is attacking protesters and using the violence that has been committed against minority groups to delegitimize and further marginalize and silence this movement. And the crackdown in, in Oromia continues. Over 10,000 people are in jail. Um, this includes the you know, prominent political um, party members like Jawar Mohammed, Bakala Garba, um, and many others. Yeah. Um, you, you knew uh, Mr. Hondesa. Um, 
and um, um, you know we have a phenomenon in in the region now. It seems you know in Uganda there is a young man called Bobby Wine, uh, who's also a musician and has captured the imagination of young people not only in Uganda but also in Tanzania, in Kenya. Um, so I mean, what was I mean? What was so special? I don't know. It's a difficult question to ask. Uh, um, what What was it about uh, uh, Undesa that 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 he spoke so much to to um, the aspirations, concerns uh, of, of of the Oromo people? I know that's not a straightforward question. It's a good question. Yeah, I think you know when when Hachalo was about sixteen years old, he was arrested and put in prison by the TPLF for his political activism. Okay. Um, he comes from a long line of uh, Oromo freedom fighters and also artists and poets, so it was very natural for him to take that up. Um, a lot of the songs that he he produced, his first album, uh, were were written in jail. Um, he is someone who is very connected to traditional um, indigenous Oromo culture and history. Um, he is very much tapped into the oral archive. And so his music connects directly with people at a very deep level. It connects with the young generation. It connects with the older generation. He brings, he draws heavily from the Oromo archive. And he has this wonderful way of connecting the past, the present, and showing people that there's a, you know, there's a future in which all of Ethiopia's people live dignified lives where all, you know, all cultures um, are equal and have the right to, to, to grow. Um, and Haj Alu, he was, you know, he was someone who was very unapologetic in terms of his progressive politics. Yeah. Um, he would give, you know, he would give interviews to main, I guess, establishment Ethiopian medias um, in Amharic. Um, and he's, he's, and he did it in such a way, he never compromised his values and he could, but he could reach across and have those conversations with people who may not agree with his point of view um, and how he, on his reading of history. Um, he was really um, such a good model for, for what uh, decolonized um, Ethiopian narrative and imagination of politics and um, national identity could be. He was very comfortable being an Oromo. He was very comfortable being an Ethiopian. He didn't see, he didn't see a contradiction between it. Um, he, this is someone who talked a lot about the injustice that the Oromo and other um, colonized nations have faced. But at the same time, he was very clear about that this, you know, he had a transformative vision. Mm. Um, and I think that, I think when Haj Alu you know, was assassinated, that's kind of what was lost, is that, like, this, here's this person, you know, Oromos have been prevented from having institutions in Ethiopia, and so, but, so, this, this person was almost like an institution, and he held within himself the promises and the hopes, as well as the archives of the past, and so, it's a, it's a huge loss, and, you know, it's, I feel like we probably won't come to grips with that, for a very, very long time. Um, a friend of mine likes to say, Ethiopia will forever be marked by pre hach Alundesa and post hach Alundesa because it's, it's a very defining moment. And if we've seen anything the last eight weeks, it's exactly how defining it is. You know, the political landscape is shifting under, right underneath our feet, so, yeah. Um, you know, we, you know, in Kenya, uh, we have Oromo speakers here as well. Um, um, we, they're known as uh, Gabra and Morana, but they're Oromo, Oromo speakers. Um, and if I was to ask you, um, um, what's an you know, what would be your ideal kind of um, governance environment for the Oromo people throughout the region, say in five to ten years' time? In Ethiopia, um, there is um, this uh, fe federal system. Where the you know, Prime Minister Abe is moving to to change that. Uh, in Kenya, um, we you know we have our uh, Gabras and Boranas who are involved in our national politics in uh, various ways. But there appears to be something um, uh, quite strong 
as it were, politically cooking, socially, politically, and economically cooking in Ethiopia around the Oromo, who I think are the single largest um, um, community in, in, in Ethiopia. Um, and so if I was to ask just aspirationally, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in terms of, you know, what would Hundesa have wanted to see in 10 years' time? Yeah. Um, that's such a good question. Um, I think... First of all, speaking of the Borana and the Gabra, you know, it sounds to me like the Borana and the Gabra in, in Kenya are able to engage in, in Kenyan politics without having to give up their identity as Borana and Gabra. They're Kenyans, but they're also Borana and Gabra, and they can bring that identity, that history. Um, in Ethiopia, uh, previously and now under Abe, uh, in order to be, in order to to engage in politics in order to uh, be, be involved in society, you need to adapt a kind of Ethiopian identity that, that strips you of your identity and your truth as an Oromo. So I think at the very, and not just as an Oromo, but also as, as a Somali, as a Hadiya, uh, uh, as a Sidama person, I think what, what historically marginalized people, uh, people of these nations want is we are already here, we are existing. We want to participate in this politics, in this society equally as ourselves, as we already are existing. Mm -hmm. um, and so Abi's um, uh, attempts and the attempts of previous rulers to, f to engineer uh, some kind of Ethiopian identity that strips, that strips uh, people of their culture, is, it's, it's like, it's a no-go, it's a dead end. I think a more progressive, and a more forward-looking uh, political system and environment is one that recognizes that Ethiopia is a country of the Amhara and the Oromo and, you know, and the Tigray people and the Sidama and the Afar um, and the Hadiyya and all the other groups that we never hear about. Um, these, um, and that makes, you know, that allows people to live on their lands and to use their lands and resources in ways that help them uh, reproduce themselves in ways that help them grow. Um, I don't think that in the 21st century, we need to be creating a, a state building or following a state building model that requires cultural genocide. I mean, why? I mean, you have, you know, we have seen in the Western world, in country, in settler colonial societies like the U.S. and Australia and Canada, what we've seen is that those, you know, those politics have been disastrous for indigenous people. You know, we know of people, we know of indigenous groups who have survived and who are trying to use the archives to bring back languages that have been essentially um, erased through genocide. Right. And so. And so I feel like I don't know why we need to be pursuing that in an African country among uh, all Africans when we could be building on the indigenous traditions of the Oromo and everyone else in that country. I mean, it's rich. Oromos have, as you know, Oromos have the Gada, which has, so, it's like an archive of pure brilliance in terms of governance. Um, I think, how about we give that a try in terms of like its principles, you know? of collaboration um, and of balancing different powers. Um, this this zero-sum game we have in Ethiopia where uh, now Abi is in power, he puts all his opponents in jail um, and he arrests everyone who disagrees with him. Well, like, where is that going to take him? The same place it took the Derg, you know? So it's, it's a waste. Um. Thanks. Um, it, just w one, one final uh, question, uh, Ayantu, um, which is to ask, um, what, what does a future portent for Abiy Ahmed and, and, and the prosperity party and, and, and the current sort of governance system that has been implemented in Ethiopia, um, what, does a, what does a future portent uh, given, um, you know, after a lot of excitement, uh, um, Nobel Prize and, and, and you know, or, or, you know, regularizing relationship with uh, the relationship with Eritrea. Um, now um, it seems to be the, the the more heavy lifting needs to be done internally. Um, so I just wanted to ask, just your 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 take on what the future portends um, if if the current trajectory is maintained. But then also to ask about you 
um, um, as somebody who's a prominent, um, uh, uh, you know, interlocutor around these issues um, of, of that, that, that we've been dis discussing. I mean, uh, how easy was, would it be for you at the current time to be able to pack up your bags, land in Addis Ababa, and continue discussing uh, there? Uh, the issues that you've been discussing with me uh, uh, from, 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 from where you are and, and, and me sitting in Nairobi, I mean, um, you, 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 you've articulated some fairly clear uh, and strong views. How, how, how do you think these would be received uh, uh, in Ethiopia? But, the, you know, the bigger picture uh, um, is that what's your take on the future of this uh, new, new administration that had caused quite a bit of excitement? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, first of all, I think we need to update our language. I don't think we should be describing Abi Ahmed anymore as an exciting leader. I don't think we should be uh, describing him anymore as a reformist, um, because he's not doing any of that. You know, there hasn't been any reform, really. Uh, as I said, he released political prisoners but he has put them back in jail. So, I mean, it, you know, it doesn't make sense. The other thing is that I didn't get to is um, in terms of the prosperity party and Abe, it's an economic question. In a country of over 80% rural population, Abe seems overly focused on the economic and political issues mattering only to a very fraction, a tiny fraction of a small historically powerful urban elite. Mm -hmm. and. You know, naturally, that has emerged as his strongest support base. Uh, and yes, they dominate the media, uh, they dominate the economics, um, and they dominate sort of like the diplomatic uh, channels where they are able to, you know, uh, put forth uh, a view of Ethiopia that, that is congruent with their vision and interests. Uh, however, um, Abi sooner or later has to face the fact that he seems to have no vision or economic plan for the rural majority or even the urban poor so far. Um, like I said, much of his economic interests and projects have been really focused on uh, beautification projects, uh, so much so that some people have called him, you know, like the minister of beautification. Um, he spent millions of dollars renovating Menelik's palace and people are like, what are you doing, you know? Um, so the narrative around Abe is really collapsing because it's, you know, even though his party's name is Pro Prosperity Party, it is not really grounded in any real prospects for, for prosperity. You know, 80% of the country needs and wants transformation, not doubling down on a failed governance model as Abe seems to do and whose costs are really a lot. Um, and, you know, I think, I don't think prosperity party is going to do well, not just in Oromia, but also in the other southern nations um, and the regions, because people are, the Oromo and obviously, but the other groups, the historically marginalized groups, are, have begun to feel deceived by Abe and the kind of reformist, uh, you know, vision that he put forth. Um, and he, the fact that he seems to be campaigning to restore a supremacist past rather than decolonize and democratize is a problem. I don't see how he'll get support in these areas um, and that he's dismantled EPRDF, yes, which had a lot of problems, but it was a potential. So the PP, many people see the PP as a dead end. So if Abi continues on this trajectory, um, expect more uh, crisis in Oromia, but also in other places that are demanding uh, self-governance, like in Waleita, where um, security forces killed uh, 24 people, between 24 and 30 people just two weeks ago. So these questions of the Oromo are not just about the Oromo, they're systemic issues. The fact that Abi is an Oromo will not change it um, because we're dealing with the nature of the beast here. Um, it doesn't matter who is at the top of the state. Um, and you know, the demand of the Oromo um, and the Cairo movement, the grassroots movement, was for a full degree of self-government, uh, self-government and genuine autonomous multinational political institutions. And we are not seeing that. In fact, the space for multinational federal federalist voices is disappearing. There is, um, the state is really preoccupied with its violent crackdown uh, of, of, of protesters in Oromia and 
uh, emulator. And it's um, even if Abe manages momentarily to crash the protests in Oromia, these questions are going to stay uh, because, because, you know, systemic issues are really like, they're unavoidable. You deal with them or you don't, um, but they're, they're there, you know. Um, in terms of like, could we, ha could we be having this conversation in, you know, in Addis Ababa, for instance? Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, you know, my friends who are Americans are in jail. They've been in jail since um, basically the, the beginning of July. Uh -huh. um, and and uh, many of them are, you know, they're, they're not politicians. Some of them are not even activists. They're just ordinary people who have been caught up in this uh, crackdown. Um, the, there's really no space, as I was saying, politically. I mean, it's going back to an old model. You, you, there is space for you if you agree with PP and it's disorganized, unclear political project, or you're out, so. Thank you. Uh, I actually, I was supposed to be there this summer doing research, uh, but first COVID happened, so I couldn't go. Okay. And then, you know, my friend Haj Ali was assassinated. So the whole summer has just been dealing with that. Yeah. Well, yeah, very sorry. And, and um, you know, on that cautionary, cautionary note, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll bring this conversation uh, to an end. I'm sure we'll be speaking again. It seems to be a fast moving uh, situation. So I'd like to thank you, Ayan, to Ayana, all the way from, you said you're in Minneapolis? Yeah, now I'm in, uh, right now I'm in Minneapolis, right. but I'll be back to Los Angeles soon. Okay, and, and wish you all the best and uh, thank you. Keep, keep up your good work. And thank you very much for speaking to the elephant this evening. Thank you. Thank you.